Oh, it is. <laughs> Thank you so much, first of all, to Keith for leading the service up to this point for the worship team. Thank you, Keith, for leading us through communion. This morning, the reading, Keith, you managed to read the second half of the reading, um, which I'm actually happy that you read the second half so that we get the full story, so we'll go back to the first half of the reading. Um, I, was, I was hesitant that we read the whole part, but um, I'm glad that we're actually going to get a chance to read the whole part because um, the reading of Scripture is so important for us to be able to hear God's word read to us. Um, this passage that comes out of Luke 24, traditionally known as the passage of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, um, normally it is um, in, the, in the church calendar, traditionally it is um, read on this particular Sunday, the first Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. What are we going to do? We're going to actually dwell at this uh, passage for some weeks. Um, I'm estimating anywhere between eight to ten weeks. And you're wondering, how on earth can you dwell on a passage for that long? Well, Scripture is like an enormous orange. You take it and you can squeeze it and you get more and more and more juice out of it. So we're going to get a lot of juice out of this particular passage. Let's um, go back to the first part of this reading from Luke 24 and from verse 13 through to verse 27. Let's follow with the words that are going to be up on the screen. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They, still, uh, they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, they asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And the Lord bless the reading and the understanding of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we take this time to listen to the exposition of your word, so we pray that your spirit would speak to us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever watched what you look like when you are watching TV? It's quite amusing. <laughs> Depending on how good the program is or the movie is, 
there comes this glazed look that goes over one's face as the movie becomes more and more interesting. And, and it's as though the world just disappears and you develop this tunnel vision and you're only focusing upon the screen. And then the mouth loses its muscle tone and it begins to drop. As you take on this very intelligent look, um, I know this has happened to me sometimes also, but a saliva begins to dribble down. Um, and then you move into this robotic action as the popcorn just goes in and out. And, and you are oblivious to the rest of the world around you. Um, that can be a very dangerous thing for a young father, especially when the kids are out doing something that they should not be doing and you are just honed in on there. And, and then somewhere in the distance, you hear this voice that starts to become more and more prevalent and begins to cut into this moment, and it's your wife, <laughs> who has been telling you for about the last five minutes <laughs> to focus on what she's saying. Uh, I, any of you relate to that experience? <laughs> well, this is kind of like the experience that we see what's happened onto the road to Emmaus. That focused on one particular thing, and we'll look at what that one particular thing is. Uh, if I put a, a title to the sermon, um, I would really put it as, The Church is All About Jesus. Church is all about Jesus. There's these two disciples who are walking on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus comes up along next to them and walks along with them, which was a common thing in those days. You just joined somebody and walked along with them because of the dangers of that would could possibly happen on the road. So walking in a larger group made more sense. And as they're going, they're talking along, uh, talking about things, and and the conversation turns to um, the current affairs of what's happening uh, around at at that time, and it gets on to the issues that have happened in the last three days. And Cleopas, the one disciple who's mentioned. Uh, he, he says something that when you read it at first value, it sounds like he's really quite well, in, well informed. But, but when you read it quite carefully, you realize this guy has just lost what's going on. He's one of those who's just phased out and he's not realizing what's going on around him. And, and Luke takes the pain to, uh, to mention Cleopas, he doesn't mention the other disciple, but he mentions Cleopas, and, and, and you wonder, why did he mention him? Well, we know he was among the disciples. Uh, we know about the twelve because those are mentioned. But we don't know about all the others, and we know at, at, at times there were up to 72. And then when we get into the book of Acts, we read about the, 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 there was this 120. So we know that Cleopas was amongst them. But who on earth was this guy Cleopas, because Luke takes pain to mention him. Well, we don't really don't know who he was, but what we do know is um, the church historian e Eusebius of Caesarea, who was um, um, a, one who wrote the 300s. He was regarded as somebody with great authority in terms of church history. He was given the right to be able to record the uh, proceedings of the Council of Nicaea. So the, the ancient church placed a lot of um, uh, cred credibility on him. And he records that Cleopas was Joseph, Mary's husband's brother. Uh, so if that really was it, and let's say it was a 50-50, it, it's not looking good for Cleopas as to how he responded as to what was happening. Let's just 
Go back a bit to verse 19 of that reading. When Jesus asks him this, that, that question, what things have you been talking about? What things have been happening? As if he was oblivious, as if he had been somebody who had just journeyed in from the, from the town, or, um, from, from some other town. So they, they respond with these words. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet. Now, I want you to notice these words. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Up, up to this point, it sounds like he's kind of got the message. But he really hasn't. Because then he goes on, verse 21, but we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. At that point, he has just lost the plot. He doesn't even know what was really happening, what was going on. And then he, he gets himself deeper into this hole when he goes, and what is more, when you put that on, you really start to show that you are separated from the message which you're giving. You don't own this message. What is more, that, that it's, it's, it's the third day that, it, that this has taken place. That this has taken place. And verse 22, he then goes on, and in addition, he's now getting himself even further and further away from the message. Some of our women amazed us. And they talk about that. They went to the tomb. And, and, and then he gets himself even further away when he talks about that some of our companions had. And he's just separating himself further and further and further from this message. And he's showing that what has happened, he's gone into this mode where he's just oblivious to the reality of what is happening around him. Well, one could say that, well, maybe they were in a state of shock. Maybe that will fly. Maybe it was that they actually really just weren't listening and paying attention to what Jesus had said to them for the past three years. And they hadn't paid attention to the Old Testament. They just weren't paying attention. Maybe they had pegged their hopes on Jesus as though he were just like one of the Old Testament prophets. And the opening statement really just gives it away. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. It sounds like they were talking that maybe it was like of the ilk of Elijah. They were out of touch with the reality of what was happening and what was going on around them. Now what's important about this? You see, their expectations that they had were they going to build the church based on those? You can see the problem already that is developing. If they were going to build the, the church based on, the, on, on these expectations and, and this understanding of who Jesus is, there was going to be a problem immediately. You see, our expectations develop into actions. And if our actions are based on wrong expectations, you can imagine the kind of church that would be built. And we don't have to be a scholar in church history to realize that the church at times has built its foundation or has taken a foundation based upon wrong expectations of who Jesus is and has come out with something that doesn't even look anything like what Jesus um, built the church as. Now remember that these disciples had been amongst the twelve, and whether they had, they had been direct witnesses of or had been secondary witnesses of, there was a moment, um, and we talk about it as Peter's confession, comes in uh, Luke chapter 9. Peter's confession of Jesus. We'll follow up on the screen. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? Remember now, as we go much further on the road to Emmaus, Jesus asking in a roundabout way, well, who is it that, that you're talking about? 
Verse 19, so they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets of long ago who has come back to life. But what about you? Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone, and he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things. Now notice this carefully. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Here it's clear. This is what Jesus has come to do. How on earth did Cleopas get this wrong? How did he get it wrong? How did he, three days after Jesus had died, on the day of his resurrection, him and this other disciple had already come up with a mutation of what they thought the gospel was. That's how quickly Satan can get into our thinking and start to make the church something else. The church is about Jesus and has always been about Jesus and always will be about Jesus. Remember our expectations of, this, of the Word of God and how we read the Word of God is going to dictate how we are going to develop the church and what we expect from the church. Jesus is the center of his church. The moment we move him ever so slightly out that center, it no longer becomes about Jesus. It becomes about that, that tiny little thing we slide into that vacuum where Jesus is moved out the center. It becomes about that. And so Jesus began to unpack Scripture to them as he refocuses them. It's beautiful that you see that Jesus doesn't rebuke them and say to them, listen, what's the matter with you guys? It's like the day of my resurrection and you really got it wrong. I'm going to give you a fat smack across the ear roll. Just get you right. No, he, just, he begins to unpack Scripture. And we wonder what scriptures those were. Luke doesn't go into which ones they were, but we can assume that it started with Genesis because it talks about beginning with Moses and then going through the prophets. And when, when they talk about beginning with Moses, it, it's the first five books of the Bible. It started with the reason why Jesus needed to come, with the fall of man. And that promise that was made in the garden, which was all about Jesus. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Moving through the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, moving, moving through the continued revelation of how God had revealed himself over and over again throughout the law of Moses, those first five books. Moving on to the prophets, the history of the nation of Israel, and the times that God had come again and again and had revealed himself and shown himself to to the nation of Israel and to the surrounding nations over and over again revealing his purposes. At no point can, could one ever say that you didn't know. And this is, must, must be for us one of the things that we need to take careful caution of. And I know that this is a teaching that happens within the church is that because we have the New Testament, we don't have to worry about the Old. I remember early in my ministry doing an example of that, and um, I was nearly excommunicated for it. But I took my own Bible, and I took that one piece of paper that separates the old and the new, and all it says on it is New Testament. And I took it, and I tore it out of the Bible, and I said, that's your problem. Well, they gasped so much that anybody who had been walking past was immediately sucked into the church. The New Testament is reflected in the old. Everything that's in the new is in the old. It's there in plain sight. And so Jesus opens this up and they realize, oh, yes. 
Because you see, the church is built upon Jesus and upon his purposes and upon the things that he wants to achieve. But the moment we reduce the church down to not being about Jesus, we are going to make it about something else. Now, there's a problem that happens for those of us who are ministers. And I don't know those who have served as ministers, Keith and Chaz and um, uh, John and, and Kevin, uh, uh, that when people hear you are a minister, the one thing that they seem to do is that they think you have a deep love for church architecture. It's like, why do they do that? And so I've, I've had this experience at times that the moment people hear that I'm a minister, they, they then want to tell me about the excursions they had to, to Europe and all the beautiful cathedrals that they have gone to see. I hate architecture. I cannot stand it. It's like shoving pins into my eyes when people start telling me about the architecture of this and that. And I then phase out. Like I'm watching TV, I phase out on something else. But for some people, that's what the church is all about. It's about the building. And I've heard it where people have gone, oh, you've got to go to that church. They've got the most amazing building. Who cares? Yes, the building's nice, but it's not Jesus. We can also make the church about about me. You've got to do something for me. When I move Jesus out the center, it becomes about me. Cleopas and his companion were very close to moving it in that direction. We can also make it about the pastor. You have a new pastor. Oh, you've got to come to our church. You've got to see our pastor. He's so nice. You can't pay me enough to be nice. If you're going to pay me to be nice, you need to make my salary a hundredfold. I'm here to preach Jesus, which means that some of you are going to be offended. Some of you are going to hate me and some of you will love me. You're coming here to hear about Jesus and Jesus alone. And sometimes we make the church about its programs. We do this, we do that, we do that, and we fall in love with those things. Now, all of these things have a place, but they're not the center. The center is Jesus. On two occasions, Paul in his letters speaks about Jesus as being the center and we'll quickly visit those two passages before we come to an end. The first one in Colossians chapter 1. A magnificent passage. Let's listen to it. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him he is before all things and in him all things hold together and he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy Notice just, just that one thing that I want to pull out there. He is the head. I think the reason why it becomes difficult for us to tell people who don't know about Jesus, about Jesus, is because we have made the church something other than about Jesus. He's the head. People want to know about Jesus. They don't care about all the other things. It's peripheral. They want to know about Jesus. You can't be saved by a building. You can't be saved by a pastor, Lord forbid, that you get saved by me. 
You can't be saved by anything else other than Jesus. And so he's the head, and we keep him as the head. We keep him as the head, and he is the head by virtue of the authority that he holds. Because that authority has been the firstborn among creation, meaning that he is the one who holds authority over all creation. And he holds that position because he died on the cross and rose from the dead. He holds authority over all things, whether things seen or unseen. So, he is the one that you and I focus on at all times. And so, what does the church focus on if Jesus is the center of it? And if Jesus took the trouble to correct Cleopas and his companion, to correct them, through scripture. What is it? What is the purpose of the church? Well, Paul writing to the Ephesians in chapter 3. Although I'm less among the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, to make plain to everyone the administration of his mystery, of, 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 sorry, of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Now notice what he's saying here. The purpose and the reason of the church that we exist is to preach the boundless riches of Christ. That's it. I remember listening to um, somebody who I regarded as, as um, if I call it a mentor within the faith, uh, he was telling me that at one particular service that he was preaching, somebody came up to him and said to him, his name was Brian, and said to him, Brian, um, I always hear that you only preach about the gospel. And he said, well, I'll only stop preaching that when you repent. I won't preach about anything else. We preach the boundless riches of Christ. And that is it. The world out there wants to know about Christ. The people in the church want to know about Christ. Because in him, everything we need is found. Everything. And everything that you and I are looking for is in Christ. It's not in a particular church. It's in Christ. It's in him and in him alone. And he makes it plain to be preached and to be so that who hears. Notice that the focus here is who's hearing. And it's quite strange when you look at it. That God's manifold wisdom, his eternal purposes would be heard and, and be known by that which is out in the heavenlies. Why them? Why not us? Why them? When you look out in the city of Mandaraya, the people who don't know Jesus, who's holding them captive? Who's holding them captive? Those heavenly realms must hear Jesus is Lord of creation. He's the head of the church. And he's looking for his church to go out there and to speak the boundless riches of Christ. That they may be saved. Because Jesus died for them. And within the church, 
Who holds our minds captive when we start to veer off like Cleopas and his companion within hours of the resurrection begins to veer off and starts to make Jesus into something else? Who holds that captive? They need to hear that within our lives, Jesus is the center. In a sense, it's to say, Jesus is the center of my life. If you want to come along and do anything here, you're going to deal with him. Go to him first and ask permission if you can come and touch me. And you'll get his answer. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. He's the center and he's the reason why we meet He's the reason why we are here. And he's the reason why this church exists and will continue to exist. And the work of his church is the work that we are busy with. Let's keep him at the center at all times. Let's not put anything else at the center. Jesus and Jesus alone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is all about you, the work that you did through your son Jesus. It is his church. Belongs to him and him alone. And we thank you that because he holds all authority, power and might over all things, that whether things that have been created that are visible or things that are created that are invisible, whether there are thrones or powers or, or authorities, each and every single one of them will bow to the name of Jesus. And so we pray that you would aid us, assist us, and guide us and guard us. That at the center of our lives, at the center of our minds, will be Jesus and Jesus alone. That at no point would we be nudged off the path. But that we would always be centered on the path. Giving glory to you and to you alone. In Jesus' name. Amen.